Once upon a time, on a beautiful autumn afternoon, in the midst of the jungle, a group of animals decided to play a football game. The problem was that no one could tackle the rhinoceros. Once he got his head of steam, he just seemed to always be unstoppable. And so on this day, when he received the opening kickoff, he rambled right down the center of the field for a touchdown. And suddenly the score was seven to zero. But somehow, the other animals were able to keep the ball away from the rhinoceros during the remainder of the first quarter and even to the beginning of the second quarter. And the score was tied seven to seven. But then at the next kickoff, the lion tried to warn the zebra not to kick the ball to the rhinoceros. But the zebra ignored the warning and the rhino caught the ball and immediately raced down the field toward another touchdown. But suddenly, from seemingly out of nowhere, the rhinoceros was brought down with a vicious tackle. And when the animals unpiled, it was discovered that the centipede had made the tackle. That was, con that was fantastic congratulated the lion. But where were you on that opening kickoff? And the centipede replied, I was still putting on my shoes. <laughs> Forgive me. Looking around this morning, in this congregation, I don't see any centipedes today. But I do see a group of Christians being called by God to make the touchdown of a lifetime. Our morning's text from Mark's Gospel is a call from God. And it's a call for each of us to put on our shoes to take up the cross and to follow Jesus wherever it leads. Wherever Jesus leads. No matter the cost. So let's this morning go back for just a bit in time and see how all of this comes about. The disciples and Jesus are passing through the village of Caesarea Philippi. Certainly, they've been on a very long journey. They're hungry, they're thirsty, and they're tired to the point of weariness. And we meet up with the disciples as they sit down at the feet of their teacher. And without warning, we hear Jesus calling them calling the disciples to tackle the question of a lifetime. He looks at the disciples and with very intense eyes says, Who do you say that I am? It's no surprise that Jesus asked his disciples this momentous question in the region of Caesarea Philippi. For on the hills overlooking the city was a magnificent temple built in honor of the Roman emperor, Caesar. And like all rulers of the day, Caesar was worshipped as an almighty God. The city was also a place of worship for the Phoenician god Baal and the Greek god Pan. In Caesarea Philippi, history, religion, and yes, politics 
all came together to exalt many pagan gods. And it is in this pluralistic setting that we hear Jesus asking the disciples a most provocative question. I can just see them sitting in that circle. Jesus looking at them. Jesus' eyes intent on an answer. And I can hear Jesus saying to the disciples, Who do you say that I am? No, that's not the way I believe that Jesus said it. I believe Jesus looked at the disciples and said, Who do you say that I am? The question hits the disciples blindsided. And so they tried to turn the answer away from themselves and answer Jesus by saying who people thought Jesus might be. And they answered Jesus by saying, Jesus, some folks are saying that you're John the Baptist. Others are calling you Elijah. And then there are some people outside of this circle who really don't know who you are, but their best guess is that you're one of the prophets. But Jesus has had enough of the disciples circumventing the question. And I can see him looking straight at the disciples And asking that heart-stopping question. But what about you? You, my followers. You who know me best. Who do you say that I am? And I can imagine this morning that all the hosts of heaven must have stopped in their tracks and failed to breathe while waiting for an answer. For just a moment in time, the world must have stood still, for the fate of humanity rested upon the disciples' answer. Oh, yes. And who was to answer on behalf of the disciples? Of course, the young, headstrong fisherman named Peter. With a clear commitment and with eyes which were surely sparkling, we can hear this morning Peter's affirming voice proclaiming, You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And I believe that this is God's message for each of us on this day. Our God is not just another God. Our God is the God, the one God, the only God. And our God does not ask us for a sacrifice because our God is the sacrifice. And this, my friends, is the good news of Jesus Christ. But there's more to this story, isn't it? Jesus took up his cross, he didn't just make a sacrifice. Jesus took up a cross, voluntarily took up a cross. And we're called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We're called to follow Jesus, to take up our own cross, without regard to what such actions might cost us. You and I are called to deny ourselves, 
to take up our God-given cross and not just follow Jesus when it's convenient, but to follow Jesus day after day after day, even when the cross cost us dearly. Contrary to common belief, the cross is not just a burden for us or a challenge in life that we cannot escape and simply must endure. Rather, the cross is something that you and I can evade. But we are called, nevertheless, to take up that cross willingly, even when the end results of carrying that cross are unknown to us. My brothers and sisters, Jesus could have evaded the cross on which he gave himself up for us. But in dark Gethsemane, Jesus reluctantly yet willingly accepted the cross that was presented to him. And in that moment, Jesus redefined grace and discipleship for all Christians, for you and for me, for all time and for eternity. Once upon a time, I did an application to seminary. It's hard to believe it was as long ago as it was. And we had to write on, as part of our entrance exams, entrance application, a dissertation, a short one, but nevertheless a, deep, uh, a dissertation on our thinking about one of the great people, Christians, within the church. Oh, and I look back now, and I'm so glad I threw away that paper because I chose to write on the martyrdom of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the priest and saint who was martyred for opposing Adolf Hitler, talks about grace and discipleship better than I ever could. For just before he died at the hands of Nazi soldiers, Bonhoeffer defined grace. Bonhoeffer described the cost of discipleship. This morning, I share with you a brief context from this Christian martyr. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of God's church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow upon ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance without church discipline. Cheap grace is a grace without discipleship, grace without a cross. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl of great price. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his net and follows Jesus. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer took up his cross and followed Jesus all the way to his death in a Nazi concentration camp 
He could have saved himself by denying the cross. But he took up that cross and he paid the price. Friends, true discipleship is never cheap discipleship. For following Jesus, yes, even following Jesus in today's world can come with a mighty cost. And as I look back upon us this morning, I am certain that Christ is speaking to this congregation this morning. He's asking each of us anew to take up the cross of Jesus, to follow him wherever it leads. And he's offering us an opportunity to start afresh. Christ's invitation is not about the folks on the pew with you. Christ's invitation this morning is about you. It's about me. It's about the cross that each of us is being asked to carry. And so I ask today, are you willing, indeed eager, to see God at work in new ways in your life? Will you choose to work to identify God's newness in your life, particularly when it doesn't seem evident to you? Are you determined to trust in God's ways? Most particularly when you are apprehensive about where God is leading you. And in all things, and with the cross you are being asked to carry, Are you willing to give thanks to God? To be certain, there is a dividing line in our lives. A line that separates authentic faith from cheap grace. To carry the cross of Jesus. You and I don't have to be prominent preachers. We don't have to be famous. We just have to be the persons that God intends for us to be. The cross is about self-denial. The cross cuts across the grain of conventional wisdom. Popular piety and natural inclinations. The cross is about being a centipede. Putting on our shoes day after day after day and following Jesus. No matter the cost and never, ever turning back. For the cross that we're being asked to carry today, we give thanksgiving to God now and forever. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.